usually when I start my messages, I like to start off with the good news of the morning. Uh, but today, church, the good news comes in the form of breaking news. You see, anyone that knows me or has been around my household, they know that there are at least four times in the day where the TV privileges and the remote control is overridden by Mrs. Fields, my wife. It doesn't matter what room we are in or what we're watching on TV. If she comes in the room and says, news please, that means that we have to change the channel and turn it to the news. <clears throat> she makes sure that we don't miss Good Morning America, David Mural around 5.30, late night news, and 10 o'clock news. Those are all non-negotiables in my house. And if she's not home, she'll send me a message about five minutes before the news comes on and says, make sure you record the news. And every so often when watching the news, you have your regularly scheduled news, but there will be a prompt that comes across the screen that says, breaking news. And me, I'm a sports watcher, so ESPN, there always is a prompt coming across the bottom of the screen that says, breaking news. See, when there is breaking news, it usually interrupts the regularly scheduled program because there is something going on that is unexpected something going on that is unordinary something going on that requires the urgent attention of the people breaking news so today church i'd like to speak from the subject breaking news the Easter story. Turn to your neighbor and say, breaking news. The Easter story. If you're watching online, just type in breaking news. And if I could go into my sanctified imagination for just a moment, if we were to wake up this morning at the time of this text and turn on our televisions somebody out there is saying well they didn't have tvs at the time of the text but in my sanctified imagination we can all wake up and turn on a television there would be something that says something to the extent of good morning we interrupt your regularly scheduled program to bring you some breaking news over in Jerusalem there is a lot of controversy and commotion going on around the tomb where Jesus of Nazareth was crucified on Friday they would say something like we're not sure at the moment what is going on but there is reason to believe that the tomb in which he was buried in this morning was empty now now whoever's breaking the news usually they're at the headquarters so they don't have all the information they have to go to somebody closer to the ground to get the developing story so if we went to the person on the ground this morning for the developing story they would say something to the extent of we are here at the tomb of joseph of arimathea where the one named Jesus of Nazareth was crucified. Not only was he crucified, but they placed him in the tomb. And Paul had ordered that the tomb be sealed and guarded. But to our dismay this morning, when we went to the tomb, the, the stone had been rolled away. And the, the person on the ground, they can take you into the place that they're talking about. So I can see him saying, follow me into the tomb where you can see where his body had been placed and the clothes that he was wrapped in have neatly been placed beside the body. And on the ground, there is rumors that maybe his disciples had come and stolen the body. There are also talks about him saying something about he was going to die, but in three days, come again. 
and because we can't explain it because we can't explain what's going on we're gonna have to do a little bit more digging and get back to you so the good news of the morning church the good news of the morning church uh, the breaking news uh, the unexpected unordinary event that occurred early this morning that requires your urgent attention is that he rose from the grave Jesus is alive isn't that good news today I said isn't that good news today isn't that good news today the fact that he rose is what sets us apart from all these other religions and denominations you see you can google where Buddha was buried you can look up where Muhammad was buried, but when you look up where Jesus was buried, you won't find anything because he got up just like he said he could. And that is the breaking news. I didn't mean to do all that this early. <laughs> <laughs> so as we get into our text now that you have the breaking news let's talk about the Easter story see Easter is arguably the most important Sunday to the Christian faith it is our biggest celebration the day we not only celebrate but we remember the resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. But sometimes we need to often think about what this day would look like if Jesus had not gotten up like he said he would. The fact is that if Christ had not gotten up from the dead, then our faith would have no foundation. In Paul's first letter to the church at Corinth, in the 15th chapter, he says, And if Christ had not been raised, then all of our preaching is useless, and your faith is useless. And we apostles would all be lying about God. For we have said that, Christ, that God raised Christ from the grave. But that can't be true if there was no resurrection of the dead but because he got up I said because he got up like he said he would that means that today our faith is confirmed our faith is secure and our faith is sure and in, in doing my research around reporting and the way the news breaks it's often important to point out that when there's breaking news, there's usually a developing story or a backstory. And the backstory is important because it is the set of events that leads up until the, the main plot or the main story. The narrative, the history, all of the chronological events that preceded the event which eventually broke the news. So if the breaking news is that Jesus is alive today, then the backstory must be some of the events that preceded the resurrection. Yeah, yeah. So today we are going to talk about the Easter story. And I don't not only want to tell you the story, but I also want to point out some of the key events and key players throughout this experience. Most importantly, today, I want to try to point out some key things that we can take away from this story to apply in our lives and worship today and ultimately answer the question of why Easter is so important. So let's get into the backstory. The week leading up into the crucifixion is often called Passion Week. From Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday, the name represents the passion with which Jesus willingly went to the cross to become our ultimate sacrifice. 
The events of Passion Week can be found in all four Gospels. Matthew, the 21st chapter through the 27th chapter. Mark, the 11th chapter through the 15th chapter. Luke, the 19th through the 24th chapter. And John, the 12th through the 19th chapter. But what is more interesting in, in studying this about all four accounts is the chronological order in which these events are presented. You see, it's four different writers. And although there are some slight variations with timing, the order of the events and the events themselves have no alteration. That means that each four of these writers in their different stories all agree that the story happened the same way. And for us, church, when studying, if we want to learn, it's important that we not only look from Friday to Sunday, but that we have a good grasp of all of the events that preceded the crucifixion which also helps us have a great understanding and paints the picture of why today is so important. So in your study time, when you're studying these texts, you almost have to flip between all four of the books in order to see the complete story. It's important to point out that these events occurred while Jesus was on the road to completing his earthly purpose. For it had been prophesied that he would be born of a virgin, live sin free among the world, be crucified and come again. So we would be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that along our road to completing our earthly purpose, whatever that may be in whatever capacity that is, here Jesus sets a perfect example for us with the story of Calvary. The first stop that we want to make in this story, the Easter story, is the fig tree and the cleansing of the temple. I say here in this portion that Jesus shows and exudes his authority. To bring it a little bit closer, he regulates. Turn to your neighbor and say, he regulates. He uses these two opportunities to reset some things, to recalibrate some things, to put some things back in order, all while teaching us and his disciples. Using the figure of the fig tree in Matthew and Mark, Jesus takes the time to instruct his disciples about what will befall the nation that has rejected its king. And from this encounter, he goes into the temple and he cleanses it. Both of these situations, he is acting within his authority. And he is exuding or showing his authority as the Messiah. In the story of the fig tree, to sum it up, Jesus is hungry and he sees a fig tree from the distance. He approaches the fig tree because it has leaves as if it has bared fruit. But when he approaches the fig tree to get some of the fruit, he discovers that the tree has no fruit. And, and in this illustration, Jesus is taking the time to show us that the fig tree which has the backdrop of Jerusalem, yeah. were mirror images of each other. Yeah. Let me bring it a little bit closer. Uh -huh. Jesus was hungry and approached a fig tree because yeah. from the distance it had the appearance yeah. of bearing fruit. Yeah. Here he illustrates his identity and he shows his authority as the judge who has come to a nation and found that that nation he has come to, despite its leafy appearance, has not produced the fruit that God desired. And then he goes from here to cleansing the temple. The Bible tells us that when Jesus went into the temple, 
He began to drive out the vendors and sellers who had set up shop within the temple. So it's important to point out that this was during the time where the, the leaders of the church had allowed it to be okay for currency exchange in the temple for profit. And the animal sellers were set up because this was also during the time of animal sacrifice. And according to the old law, in order to sacrifice an animal, it had to be blemish free. So instead of offering God their best, instead of giving God the best that they had to offer, they decided to do the next best thing. Why offer a sacrifice when I can buy a sacrifice? So the vendors started selling animals for sacrifice. And the business began so good that they set up shop right in the temple for convenience. So if I didn't have a sacrifice, I could just stand in line and purchase a sacrifice. And when Jesus witnessed this, all of this confusion stirred up something on the inside of him. Because there was confusion in God's house. There was chaos in God's house. There was no order in God's house. So the Bible says that Jesus came in and drove them out. He said that my house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it a den of robbers. In these two instances, there is something that we can take away that I think that God is trying to teach us today. Here he is saying to us that the church, we as a nation, we as the church, we as the people are in a time in our lives where we need to do just as Jesus did and regulate. Some of us in our lives, some of us in our church homes and this world in general, we need a little recalibration, a little cleaning up. He's saying that we have given off the appearance of having fruit, but we have no fruit. Instead of offering God the best, instead of giving God our best in our ministries, instead of giving God our best with our gifts, we've become okay with just enough. We've become okay with just getting by. We've replaced our preachers and choirs with playlists and PowerPoint presentations. And God is saying that in our church homes and in our lives that we as a nation need to regulate some things. We need to get back to being spiritual. If the fig tree was the mirror image of Jerusalem, then God is saying that the fig tree is a mirror image of us today. We have no fruit. Matthew, the seventh chapter says, thus by their fruit will you recognize them. This was during a time when the church was getting rich while the people were suffering. That's right. That's right. The leadership was taking advantage of the people. God is saying that our churches have become too gimmicky. We may not have booths set up in the lobby, but we have a pay for pray worship experience. No, throughout our history as the black church has been a foundational piece and now it's becoming the afterthought. We have gotten too big to allow people to come here when they're hurting, to come here when they're confused, when they to come here when they are in need of help and hope. And God is saying there's too much confusion in my house. There's too much chaos in my house. There is no order in my house. Church doors closing all over the nation. Members leaving in droves because they feel that the church has no place for them. Yes, sir. But the Bible says, come to me, all ye who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. God is saying, church, that we've got some cleaning up to do. Yes, sir. 
we are in need of some regulation and that we are giving off the appearance of fruit but have no fruit. After he regulates, after he shows his authority, the next thing that happens is his authority is challenged. Turn to somebody and say his authority was challenged. We must first point out that during this time, Jesus' enemies had been doing everything that they could. They had been waiting a long time for a moment to apprehend and destroy Jesus. They wanted to catch him slipping. So they went out of their way to challenge him in front of the multitude. They wanted to distort. And change the people's view and opinions of who they knew Jesus was. So they began to follow him. They began to question him on doctrine and question him on theory. They challenged him on taxes. The Bible says in Luke, the 20th chapter, the 20th verse, keeping a close watch, keeping a close watch on him. They sent spies who pretended to be sincere. They hoped to catch Jesus in something he said so that they might hand him over to the power and authority of the governor. So the spies questioned him. Teacher, we know that you speak and teach what is right and that you do not show any partiality, but teach, but that you teach the way of God according to the truth. Is it right for us to pay taxes to Caesar? Each time they challenged him. He didn't get loud. He didn't get mad. He didn't get frustrated. He just used that opportunity to regulate some more. He tells them to render unto Caesar what is Caesar's and unto God what is God's. But at this time, while his enemies were challenging him, God, Jesus himself, takes the time to warn the people about this type of leadership. In the 46th verse of the 20th chapter, he said, beware of the teachers of the law. They walk, they like to walk around in flowing robes and love to be greeted with respect in the marketplace and have the most important seats in the synagogue and the places of honor at banquets. But they devour widows' houses and for sure, for a show, make lengthy prayers. These men will be punished most severely. You see, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they were the leaders of the church, the keepers of the law and the traditions. But they themselves, that Jesus warned, had lost sight of what was most important in God's house. Once he regulated this, once he challenged their mentality, Once he challenged what they were doing, he found himself in a position where his enemies started to join together in the plot to get rid of him. The Sadducees and the Pharisees began joining together because nothing to this point had worked, but they had to get rid of Jesus. The Sadducees wanted him gone because they feared that he had become too popular. His efforts for temple reform, when he cleaned up the temple, it directly affected their revenues. You see, they had their hands in the cookie jar and he was messing with the cookies. They felt that it was their responsibility to preserve the social order. And the Pharisees wanted to do away with them because they were the ultra conservative religious teachers. They had the vested prestige and all this new teaching, all this radical methodology that he was coming in with was taking the attention off of them. They held Jesus as a lawbreaker. They said that he showed no regard for the Sabbath and their ceremonial rituals and requirements. So now we have found ourselves at a point where Jesus' enemies have kind of started getting together and plotting on how they can get rid of him. Now there's a lot that happens in between the time 
that we left off and where we're going to pick this story back up. But we want to pick it up around the time where Jesus is arrested and tried. Luke, the 22nd chapter and the 47th verse, we see that Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss. And he is seized by the army and taken to the high priest. And as the 23rd chapter opens up, it tells us that he goes from Annas to Caiaphas, the high priest, where he is mocked and ridiculed. He is then tried and questioned by Pilate. And Pilate couldn't find anything wrong, so he sent him to Herod. And Herod, they ridiculed and mocked him some more, but they couldn't find anything wrong, so he sent him back to Pilate. Now, it's important to point out that all throughout this process, Jesus' trial was illegal. It was unlawful for him to be tried at night. It was unlawful for him to be tried before the Sabbath. His charges were unproven and the prosecution's witnesses' stories were not corroborated. They could not agree. It was also illegal if the death penalty was the sentence to try, convict, and carry out a sentence all within the same day. But even with all of this going on, Pilate eventually gave in to the will of the people. And he washed his hands of the situation. And he gave the people the option, Barabbas or Jesus. And the people chose Barabbas over Jesus. And I think today, church, God is asking us to ask ourselves the question, what have you chosen over Jesus? What have you chosen over Jesus? Because it was something that struck me as interesting throughout this whole story was the difference in the will and determination of Jesus' enemies around their common goal and the lack thereof of Jesus' disciples. You see, Jesus' enemies came together around a common goal. They talked to each other. They plotted with each other. They planned every night. When they went on their mission to challenge him, they tried at every turn to catch him up on something wrong. They were almost relentless in their pursuit to get Jesus. The Bible even says in the 23rd chapter and the 12th verse that Herod and Pilate became friends. Because before this, they were enemies. But everything that they tried with Jesus, they could find no fault in him. But on the contrast... When we look at the examples of Jesus' people throughout this story, we start off with the illustration of a fig tree appearing to bear fruit but has no fruit. We go into the temple where the temple leaders are defiling and causing chaos in the temple. We go on in the story and Jesus is betrayed by one of his disciples. And when the other disciples were supposed to be watching at the Mount of Olives, they were sleeping. Not only that, but while he was being tried, his own disciple was in the courts denying that he even knew who Jesus was. And God is asking us to ask ourselves, what have you chosen over Jesus? Doesn't this sound familiar to us today? We are in a time where Jesus' authority is being challenged at every turn. In our homes, in social media, in corporate America, wherever you turn, it seems like all of the church's enemies are plotting together. They join together in, in their common goal. Every so often, we hit a point where the world tries to 
point at the church and try to catch us up on our hypocrisies. They try to catch us up in our, our doctrine and our theology. Well, you said love this person, but you don't love this person to, to wake the unwoke. And today is no different. But the difference between us and Jesus is they could find no fault in him. But we, like the Sadducees and Pharisees, have our hands in the cookie jar. We have that do as I say, not as I do mentality. What have you chosen over Jesus? All I'm saying is we need to meet the challenge with the same energy. With the same energy. Now, his enemies had the wrong purpose, but their energy was desired. The efforts were bad, so all we need is the same energy just for a different purpose. Where is your vigor for prayer? Where is our relentlessness for soul saving? Where is our energy for helping build up God's kingdom? We are in a time when our lives and our families and our churches are being attacked on every front. But where are God's people? There's a mass of people out there in the world that need God. They need the word. They need church. But they don't have anyone to show them the way. Because God's people have become too busy. We become distracted. We become disinterested. We have fallen asleep and we have denied him. What have you chosen over Jesus? This whole time, Jesus had been teaching his disciples, trying to get them ready for a time such as this. But when the time came, they were not ready. When he came back to get the fruit, it had no fruit. Each challenge that they faced, they failed. But what would it look like if all of God's children could put our differences aside, could put our theologies and doctrines aside, and all get on a common page, and all get on a common goal and be relentless in our efforts around a common goal, soul winning for Christ. Because Jesus said, if I be lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men unto me. Last part that we want to hit on with the Easter story. Jesus was crucified. The Bible says that after he was tried illegally, he was convicted and sentenced to death by crucifixion. It tells us that he was beaten and mocked, that a crown of thorns had been put on his head. He was spit on, disrespected, Ridiculed, the Roman soldiers with their whips, with shards of bones and rocks, lashed our Savior's skin and ripped through his skin. The Bible says that he never said a word. Can you picture going through something like that? All by the same people he was trying to save. All he ever did was love. All he ever did was teach. All he ever did was forgive. And all we showed him was the way to the hill called Golgotha. As he carried the crossbeam of his cross. After taking so much punishment, his body was weak exhausted and famished so weak that he had to get help carrying his cross and they nailed his hands and his feet to the cross and for us he hung and died the 23rd chapter of Luke the 44th verse says it was now about noon And darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. 
For the sun stopped shining and the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last breath. 47th verse says, the centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, surely this was a man of God. Now, what's important to me and I want to point out is that the writer takes the time to say that when Jesus died, he says that the sun stopped shining and the veil or the curtain of the temple was torn in two. And I don't want you to miss out on that blessing right there. You see, this was during a time when only the high priest or the direct descendant of Aaron could walk through the curtain in the temple. Only on the day of atonement to sprinkle the blood of the atoning sacrifice in the temple. You see, through the curtain, it was the place called the Holy of Holies. There was the presence of God. But because of men's sinful nature, we were not worthy to stand in the holy of holies. We could not stand in the presence of God. So the curtain is important because it symbolized the separation between God and man. You see, the curtain separate God's most holy place, God's presence from the people. So the tearing of the veil or the tearing of the curtain in the temple was significant, not only because it happened, it was significant when it happened and how it happened. The tearing of the curtain at the moment that Jesus died dramatically symbolized that his death, that his sacrifice, that the shedding of his own blood was a sufficient atonement for our sins. It signified that now the way into the holy of holies, now the way into the presence of God was open for all people for all time. Since the high priest was the only one that could pass through the curtain to be in the presence of God, now that the curtain was torn, Jesus was saying that there is now a new way to get into the presence of my father. And the fact that it tore from top to bottom symbolized that the way to get to the father is through the son. Because the son became our ultimate sacrifice at the time that he died. In the 10th chapter of Hebrews, it says, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way opened for us through the curtain, that is his body and Jesus is telling us today that if we want to find a way to the father if we want to show someone the way to the father that we have to go through him we put all these rules and restrictions on salvation and all we need to be showing the world is that the way to the father is through Jesus who in here is willing to testify about his goodness Who in here is willing to testify about his grace? Who is willing to testify that they know when I look back over my life and all the things that God has brought us through? We are. He says, I am the way, the truth, and the light, and that no man comes to the Father but by me. And if we are to look at the cross as an example of of our lives, Jesus didn't run from his calling. Jesus didn't run from his challenges. Jesus didn't run from the liars and the disrespect. 
Jesus met every challenge. He took every whip. He took every lash that he did not deserve. He forgave the ones that crucified him, that lied on him, that hated him in an ultimate show of love. So if we are to look at the cross as a perfect example, when they lie on you, love them anyway. When they hate on you, love them anyway. When they talk about you, love them anyway. The breaking news, church, of the morning is that he lives. I said the breaking news of the morning is that he lives. The breaking news of the morning is, is that he lives. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the Bible says the women took the spices that they had prepared and went to the tomb. But when they went there, they found that the stone had been rolled away. And when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. I'm going to skip down where it says, why are you looking for the living among the dead? He is not here, for he has risen just as he said. As I get ready to take my seat, someone is wondering why today is so important. Why do we celebrate? What is the meaning behind the Easter story? Yeah. And the true meaning behind the celebration of Easter, if I don't say anything else, is that we serve a God that is alive and well. Yeah. He defeated the grave. Yeah. Revelations tells us where he says, I am the living one. I die, but look, I am alive forever and ever. And I hold the keys of death and the grave. That's right. This church gives us confidence that no matter what we go through, the songwriter put it perfectly when he said, because he lives, yeah. I can face tomorrow. He said, because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds my future. We celebrate because he lives. That means that our God is true. He died like he said he would. He was buried and he rose. The Bible says that God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. We celebrate because he lives. That means that our salvation is sure. The 8th chapter of Romans tells us, Therefore, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, because through Christ Jesus, the law of the Spirit who gives life has set you free from the law of sin and death. And because he lives, this means that we have victory over sin and access to eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus. And for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but should have everlasting life. And he said, and life is worth. And life is worth the living just because he lives. God bless you.